There's been something that's been bothering me lately and I can't shake it. So welcome to a uh, short video with Rebecca and I. I try and offload the thing that's bothering me. You see, well, if you're alive and well in a developed country with the internet, it's highly likely that you might have heard of Stonehenge. You may well have even been there. Ironically, it's not actually a henge, but that's a story for another day. Now, with that in mind, you may well have heard of Avebury, another spectacular stone circle. Sits about 18 miles, almost directly north of Stonehenge. You should go and visit if you haven't already. Now, recently, I was shown a map. This one. This map, and it includes a number of things on it. Henges, uh, stone circles, wooden henges, things like that. Oddly, it implies it's a straight line. Which is strange because you kind of see Stonehenge as the centre of the, the universe. Yes, like it was the centre for the Neolithic people that constructed it. But all of a sudden things were turned on their head. We don't have the Stonehenge being the centre of the universe. With this article, we have a line, or as the article implies, a cultural boundary between the Neolithic people, the early Neolithic stone builders, and the Beaker people, the late Neolithic uh, from northeastern Europe. Come and get over here, stealing our stone circles! <laughs> anyway, so what exactly were all of these stone circles talked about? All of these monuments on route. Surely Stonehenge and Avery are the only stone circles. At least that's what we thought, but there turns out to be loads. Indeed, now the big question is then, well, do these stone circles exist? Did they exist in the first place? Do they form part of a line or a route or a trade link? Or as the article implies, a cultural boundary? Let's go and investigate. So as you can probably imagine, I mapped every stone circle I could find in Wiltshire and this line, the location, the condition, all with the extremely helpful website that is the Megalithic Portal. I'll pop the link in the description below if you like stones and megalithic structures and all that kind of thing about the landscape, this is a resource for you. I'll show you this mapped result shortly. So let's go and find a few of these structures. Now we're heading south to north from the megaliths and the blue stones of Stonehenge. And I'm often left wondering about these stones, how they came to be, and perhaps more importantly, how they've survived for around 5,000 years for the industrial age. And now that question will become more prominent for the remainder of this video. So how reliable is that original map in that article? You see, there's only a small handful of symbols on there, and there are a mix of wooden hinges and stone circles. Surely there's more than that. Are we seeing the full picture here, or a picture that's made out to fit a theory? I'm not sure, so let's start with a fresh map of our own. I've plotted both Stonehenge and Avebury on there for a little geographical context while we work our way through the rest of these structures. North of Stonehenge, well, I think Tan Hill pops up next. Well, sat below the Neolithic escarpment carrying the Mid Wilkes Way, in the 1970s, Catherine Wiltshire wrote about a miniature stone circle here. Nine upright sarsen stones, each about four feet high, with one large stone around about six foot in the centre. So if we head a couple of miles to the east, well that combined with Langdean Bottom, well they're both not accessible. Langdean Bottom stones sitting deep in Cowdown Valley. The appearance seemingly the same size and context as Wiltshire wrote about with the Tan Hill stones, though again none are standing, they all seem to be strewn about on the floor here. Now all of that is fine, but it's about time we saw something in person, something tangible. Let's have a look just to the northwest on Hairstone Down. Oh, I can see. Oh, I can see loads of them in that field there. I can see a few. There's a couple down there. There's one there. I think it's on the left-hand side. Now that fits because there's almost like a henge-like feature there, and it's got stones on the edge of it. Yeah. We're not completely sure we should be in this um, in this field, but there's no sign on the gate, was there? No, it doesn't say private, it's not locked. It doesn't say it's private. Being very respectful. Right, so if this is or was a circle, you've got one there, you've got one there right behind the camera that side, um, 
and you've got a few more on this bank. Well, we've just walked through the middle of this. It's almost like a hill fall, and there's upright sarsens over there, Rebecca. This is really cool. And on the edge of this, oh, look at this. This is a really beautiful site. Like, really, really beautiful. The valley in front of us, and there's another stone there, again, on the edge of the, uh, the, the embankment. So those ones look like they've just been piled there. Trees grown out of them. Perhaps a farmer didn't want them there, but these ones ahead of us don't look like they've been piled there. Well, certainly some of them look like they've been upright for quite some time. Look at that. When I say that, do you know what I reckon they've done with these? What? I reckon they made a horse jump out of them. I don't reckon they are stood upright from, from the original position, which is a real shame because there's, there's wooden horse jumps all around in I this field. Now as we head north, the depth of this undulating landscape really captivates and we're surrounded by burial mounds used for millennia and when we add in the stones to that landscape, these circles that once were, for whatever reason they stood, you can't help but feel part of it. And just a stone's throw away from here sits the well-documented sanctuary at the end of the southern part of the ridgeway sits next to the A4. Now archaeological excavations have revealed much about this place. The mix of standing stones and wooden poles here. In 1723 antiquarian William Stukeley drew these circles and he did a detailed map of the ones here at the sanctuary. Documented their position. Shortly afterwards however they were destroyed for agricultural purposes. Such a shame. Now the excavations here revealed two concentric stone circles, but they also told the story of a teenage boy buried with possessions such as a small beaker pot, distinctive of the style that spread from the continent. Now chemical analysis of his teeth confirmed that he may well indeed have come across from Europe and been part of this beaker movement talked about in the original article. As we leave the sanctuary and head north, there's evidence of more stone circles. Faulkner's stone circle close to Avebury. Then on north to Winterbourne Bassett. I'm left wondering now about the original map. The original map in that article, which almost drew a line. Because when we flip to ours, it's difficult to see any reasonable line at all. Instead, we seem to be clumped around locations that, well, they had plenty of available sarsens. Right, so we've now arrived in the southern part of Swindon. We've got the huge ridge in the background, which we've just come down from the south. And this is the northernmost part of today's journey. We're looking for five stone circles. That seems really odd because we're really looking for a line in this video. There's five stone circles were reputed to be just here in about a square mile. A bit muddy. So this is Day House Lane and I think the Coates Circle on the map you can see a, a very small uh, little black dots in a semicircle, sort of next to the road and already now yeah we can see some big sarsens here in front of us all sort of led down on the floor someone's taken the time to um, cut round them yeah <laughs> which is great which is really cool actually isn't it because it gives you a little bit of context of this circle yeah and um, if you can make a circle out of this, you're a better person than I am. This area of South Swindon is absolutely sarsen uh, crazy, isn't it? Every, it is <laughs> every driveway, every road back up at Broome, there's another sarsen stone just sat there. And I think we've counted it five or six now in our heads. And that's right, because in this two square mile area, there was reputed to be at least five, maybe six stone circles. Day House Lane, another adjacent to Day House Lane, Broome, Coates Reservoir, fir clumps and Hodson up on the ridge to the south side of the village. I think the uh, the folk of Swindon, the Neolithic folk, didn't read the memo when they got the stone circle uh, invitation. They just went a bit mad and had a stone circle party the place. and built six, didn't they? <laughs> a little bit. So before we conclude on this, let's check one more. Fir clumps sat next to the M5. 
Now the noise here was quite ridiculous, as you can imagine, but we did have a good look around. A.D. Passmore in 1890 concluded that the stone circle was gone. Now that's odd, because in 1965 Richard Rees declared that he had found the exact location of the stones and a small stone circle. Alas, four years later, 1969, the M5 buried its way through here and whatever remained of the stone circle. So back in the land of the Sarsons, we've got East Kennet Longborough just over the hill, West Kennet Longborough that way, Silbury Hill, we've got the West Woods full of Sarsons, we've got Lockeridge down over there full of Sarsons. Everywhere you look there's fields of Sarsons and that provided in my head very easy access to build these stones. So context of the line and context of the cultural boundary, was there really a boundary there? Was there a trade route? I'd love to think of the route because I love the fascination with the route. So why not? Maybe these stone circles did form part of a link and perhaps the people at Swindon did indeed get a little bit um, over overwhelmed with their the memo to them and went a bit mad in the construction. So <laughs> instead of reading circle, they thought the memo said circles. Yep. So they built quite a few. Quite a few. It's not really for us to, to conjecture if there was a boundary between the Beaker people and the early Neolithic, but it's up to us to go and have a look and maybe document some of these places as to the state they're in now. So this hasn't been a long form video that we said we were going to make all the time, but we still enjoy wanting to make some of these smaller ones, don't we, as well? Yeah, every so often. Every so often, so we'll squeeze some of these in as well. Yeah. So um, we'll see you next time, folks. Thanks for watching. Bye.